Hi, and welcome to our first lesson of our matter and energy unit. And before we get too far into it, now that we've had our discussions about the practice of being a scientist, uh, for each of the units that come up, we're going to take a moment at the beginning of each unit and just kind of look at how the unit fits into our overall organization of chemistry. So let's go to the Prezi and check it out. So this is really showing us sort of the overall organization of the course. And so if there's really one thing I want you to take out of the course, I'm going to take a page from Richard Feynman, and I really just want you to understand that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. And so we can kind of put each unit of the course into this larger understanding of chemistry and how chemistry works. And so for the first couple of units, we're really going to deal with the matter side of things. And so unit two, matter and energy, and unit three, phases of matter, they're both going to look at different parts of matter in the aggregate, large amounts of matter and how large amounts of matter behave and how we can describe them. So in our matter and energy unit, we're really going to be looking at types of matter, changes of matter, the types of energy that are involved in interacting with matter, and we're going to look at the math involved in measuring how much energy is stored in a substance through a process called calorimetry. Cool? All right. By the way, this presentation is linked in the info in the info field. If you want to just fire it up on Prezi and play around with it, you definitely can. You can kind of see how we've organized everything. All right, let's go back to the presentation. So you may be wondering why there's a cookie on the screen here in our first discussion. Well, we're really gonna be talking about the properties and changes of matter. And a cookie is as good a symbol as any to get us started because a cookie is of course made of matter and is made of matter that's recently been through a series of changes when it got cooked. And so it's not too bad to kind of put this notion of a cookie in your head as we talk about the different types of matter there are and the changes that matter can undergo. So chemistry is basically just the study of matter and how matter reacts and interacts with other types of matter. And of course, an obvious question is, what is matter? So the definition that we're going to use is that matter is anything that has mass and occupies volume. And in order to do this in the universe, you basically need to be made out of atoms. Now, if you look at this definition, you may wonder what mass and volume are. For our purpose, mass is going to be the quantity of matter that an object contains. People are still trying to figure out how best to describe mass from a scientific perspective. That's sort of the larger project of the Large Hadron Collider and why people have made such a big deal out of the Higgs boson, but we don't really need to worry about that for the purpose of our honors chemistry discussion. Volume is, of course, just the amount of space that an object occupies. So matter is going to just be anything that has mass and occupies volume. And in order to do that, you really do have to be made out of atoms, at least in this universe. When we want to categorize matter, we can look at it in a bunch of different ways. One way is what you see on page two of your unit two packet. That's this chart that we have right here, which breaks matter into two major types. We've got pure substances and we've got mixtures. Pure substances are then broken apart into elements and compounds, and mixtures are broken apart into homogeneous and heterogeneous types of mixtures. There's some subcategories below each of these. What I would suggest that you do is take a moment and look at it and write down any questions that you have, and then when you're ready, let's move on. So there are a couple of relevant items that we probably should discuss. I'm gonna give you a couple of different questions. I'd like you to jot down your own answers to these questions, and we'll talk about them in class tomorrow. But the first is, what's the difference between an element and a compound. They are broken apart into two different things on that previous flowchart. So see if you can figure out the relationship between them. Another good question is what's the relationship between a pure substance and a mixture? When we think about mixtures and we think about pure substances, there has to be some sort of relationship between them. Take a moment and see if you can figure out what that is. And our last question is, how does a homogeneous substance differ from a heterogeneous substance? There has to be some sort of difference, otherwise they wouldn't be two separate categories. Take a moment and jot down some answers to these questions, and then when you're ready, let's move on. So let's see how good we are at this. What I've got here is I've got a list of six different substances, and I'd like you to take a turn classifying each one as either an element, a compound, a heterogeneous mixture, or a homogeneous mixture. Pause the video and do it, and then when you're ready, play through and let's look at the answers. So here are the classifications for each of these substances. Water is a compound because it's made out of two elements chemically combined. Oxygen gas is of course just one element. Salt water is a good example of a homogeneous mixture, where we take salt and we dissolve it in water to make a solution. The way we would write this usually is we'd put a little parentheses AQ after the formula for salt to show that we've got it dissolved in water. It's in what we call aqueous solution. Soil, milk, and you, by which I mean you or me or any other living thing on the planet, are all really good examples of heterogeneous mixtures. 
Do you have any questions about this? Does this all make sense? If it doesn't, this would be a great place to make some notes to yourself. Another thing that you're going to be asked to do when you talk about the different types of matter is to draw particle diagrams. If we could envision what the individual particles of the substance would look like inside a tiny, tiny box, that's what a particle diagram is. We're going to use circles to represent the different particles. And if we need to show different types of substances in our particle diagram, we'll use shading in order to show the differences between them. This is just one substance represented as a particle diagram in the solid, the liquid, and the gas phase. We'll talk more about phases in our next unit, but for right now I just wanted to show you an example of what an acceptable particle diagram might look like for a particular substance. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to actually try drawing a couple. So pause the video and make four boxes and in each one draw the substance as shown here. Don't worry about the phase. And when you're ready, let's move on. We'll take a look and compare how yours look to mine. So a monatomic element is just going to be a sample of an element where the particles are made out of one atom. I chose to represent it like this, and this is, I guess, the gas phase, but it doesn't really matter what phase we have it in. A compound like CO2 is going to need to represent the carbon and the oxygen as separate types of substances, and we're going to need to show them all connected in that relationship of one carbon to two oxygens. This is what I came up with for that. Here's a different compound, CO, where the relationship of carbon to oxygen is now one to one. I've represented it like this. And finally, I took everything and I put it all together in order to make a mixture so we could see how all of the components of that mixture are arranged in a particle diagram. I hope that these particle diagrams make sense. If they don't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that we can discuss them in class. Another thing that's really important about matter is that matter can undergo different types of changes. When we want to break these up, we usually think about them as physical changes versus chemical changes. Let's look at the difference between them. In a physical change, no new pure substances are created. We don't make any new compounds over the course of our change. This is a good example of a physical change. We're starting with water as a liquid, and it's becoming water as a gas. We still have water at the end of it, we've just changed the phase. If you wanted to see what a particle diagram would look like for this particular change, here's one representation that I just came up with just to show you that we still have the exact same substance that we started with. In a chemical change, new pure substances are created. Here's an example of that. If we take water and we break it apart into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, that's gonna be a chemical change because we now have new substances that we did not start with. Here is that represented as a particle diagram. You can see that in our products, we have two substances that we did not start with. That's why this is a good example of a chemical change. Let's practice this by looking at a couple of different examples of changes. For each one, I want you to classify it as a physical change or a chemical change. Take a moment, pause the video, and write down your answers. And when you're ready, let's move on. These are the answers that I've come up with. Melting water is going to be a physical change because we still have water at the end of it. Rusting iron, on the other hand, is going to be a chemical change because we're making new compounds over the course of that change. Burning of wood is similar to rusting of iron in that at the end of it, we're going to have compounds that we did not have when we started. Crushing a sugar cube is still going to give us sugar, so that's a good example of a physical change. Dissolving sugar is still going to give us sugar, so that's another good example of a physical change. And stretching gum is just going to take the gum and change its shape, but we're still going to have the gum at the end of it. Rotting meat and exploding dynamite, I classified as chemical changes, but of course these are very complex processes that are going to involve both physical changes and chemical changes over the course of that change. So it's important to understand that physical changes and chemical changes are a good way of thinking about things, but that the universe can actually be more complex than it might be in the way that we try to classify it. The final thing that we're going to talk about in this lesson is the law of conservation of mass. Here's a quote from Richard Dawkins who said, nature is a miserly accountant. And what we mean here is that nothing is ever made or destroyed. It's only changed. This is seen in the law of conservation of mass. What we mean here is that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed. And so the total amount of mass that we start with over the course of a change has to equal the total amount of mass that we end with. In reality, it took chemists a long time to figure this out because some small amount of mass is frequently lost to the overall environment when we're engaged in laboratory settings. So it took very exacting kinds of experiments to establish that this was in fact the case, but this is now a well-established principle in the chemical sciences. Over the course of any change, the total amount of matter has to remain constant. Now, if you notice this asterisk, what we're really trying to say here is that there are a couple of situations in the universe specifically relating to nuclear phenomena where matter and energy are interchanged. 
But for all intents and purposes on this planet, in the vast, vast majority of circumstances, no matter is ever going to be created or destroyed over the course of a physical or a chemical change. In the few cases where this law does not hold up, I'll definitely make sure to note it very clearly so that you're aware of it. Here's a problem that we can use the conservation of mass in order to solve. This is on page five in your unit two packet. If 40 grams of substance A are reacted with 20 grams of substance B to form substance C, what should the mass of substance C be? Take a moment, pause the video and see if you can solve this problem and then we'll work through the solution. So let's take a look and see what's happening here. In this, substance A plus substance B are combining to form substance C. This is by the way, a chemical change. We're starting with 40 grams of substance A and we're adding 20 grams of substance B to that. By now, you might very well be able to figure out the answer. But so we should expect that 60 grams of substance C are produced over the course of this chemical change. And the reason for that is conservation of mass. The total amount of mass that we start with has to equal the total amount of mass that we end with. Does this make sense? If not, take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that we can deal with them later. And that brings us to the end of our discussion. Here at the end, let's make sure that you can do the following things. First, make sure that you can classify a substance as an element, a compound, a heterogeneous mixture, or a homogeneous mixture. Also, make sure that you can represent all types of substances as particle diagrams. Take a moment and make sure that you can identify a particular change as a chemical change or a physical change. And finally, make sure that you can use the conservation of mass in order to solve particular problems. If you can do all of those, you've gotten what you need to get out of this particular discussion. If you have any questions about any of the material that you've seen in this video, you can always get in touch with me by leaving a comment below the video or by the contact information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Take it easy.